Hey guys, um, this video is for unit two. I'm gonna talk through the elements I decided to put on my cheat sheet. And again, one of the assignments this week is squishing our notes to a single piece of paper. Um, so I showed this on unit one. Uh, you can see that I took about two and a half pages of notes um, from unit one, just going back over my videos, my notes, my free response questions. And then I used like a software, I think I used PowerPoint to like squish them all on one page. Uh, so you can do something like that. Um, I actually think more effectively, I, I actually did that first to see if it would all fit or how big I needed to write it. And then I actually wrote it by hand. So this is one method of memorizing some things. Again, it's an open note test. But um, in order to be quickly able to reference the reference sheet you have, you need to know what each of those items were and you need to be the person who put it there. Um, so these are the same document. I just copied it over by hand. So I'm gonna walk through um, what I did for unit two and you can kind of steal some of my information or again, use one of my methods. But I'm just looking for unit two to all show up on one page. So let's go over um, each of the elements that should be on uh, your cheat sheet for number two. Okay. So the first item is when I look at a relationship between two quantitative variables, that's unit two. So um, if I think about this, it has to be two things I measured. So there's a lot of examples of that in my notes here, but a couple of the ones I'm going to reference is your heating bills and the temperature. So if you had a um, a word burning stove or oil that you were using to heat, we would assume that if, if it gets warmer, then you're using much less or almost no oil to heat your house. So with that said, those are two things that we measure. How much we pay in money is a number we measure and the temperature outside is a number we measure. And so everything in this chapter is gonna have to do with numbers we measure. All right, so let's take a look. If you're asked to describe this relationship between those two variables, then you're gonna to wanna to make sure you list each of these items that spell the word duffs and not forgetting context. So if I look here at just this little quick sketch of the temperature and the heating bills and some dots that go around it, I'm gonna describe what I see there in one sentence. So my sentence looks like this. There is a strong negative linear relationship between temperature and heating bills with no outliers. That is a perfect answer. So it has each element, strength, direction, form, and then the context. I have to make sure I'm talking about the Y label and the X label and mention whether or not there were or not were or were no outliers. Okay. So, um, Okay, there's an example, but how could they change it? Well, if these dots were not as close to the line, I would say words more like moderate or weak. If these dots made more of a U shape, then I would say nonlinear instead of linear. If there was a dot way over here, I would say there is an outlier instead of there are no outliers. So essentially, that's what we are looking for um, from this section. Now, um, they sometimes give you a least squared regression line in the problem. So if they give it to you, they typically give it to you in this format, y hat equals a plus bx, where y, uh, the y-intercept is the first number that doesn't have the x, and the slope is the number in front of the x. So this is exactly the same as algebra, but you usually see the order backwards. y is equal to mx plus b. Um, but in our instance, we use it in this format, and I think it makes more sense chronologically. So when x is 0, you just have uh, that first value. So when you're graphing, that's usually the number you want first when you graph. So in this equation, with the context, we use terms like um, the numbers they gave us, but then you always have to put the context in. So if Y is heating bills, like we see here, it's easy to just write it in place of the Y. And then same with the X, write the word temperature in place of the X, because that's what X means. 
oftentimes definitions come up. So if they ask you to define the slope in this problem, I usually make a sketch just to remind myself that slope is the change of y over the change in x. So if y is heating bills, how much is the bill changing for every one change of temperature that day in degree? So if we look at that, that's what that number actually means now to us in real life, in the information we collected. What this is saying is that, oh, I found a little typo. I need to, I need to fix this, right? This slope is going down, right? So the slope is negative. For every one degree increase in temperature, so as we move to the right of our graph, for every degree I move to the right, we're predicting it to decrease by $3.60. So it makes sense that as it gets warmer outside, I will need less oil to heat my stove, and therefore it would be cheaper. My heating bills would go down. Now, they could also ask us to de define R squared. So if provided the value of R, notice R here is negative because we do have a negative slope. So R tells us how close the dots are to the line. And if it's negative, it's telling us that the dots are making a pattern that's going down. This is our correlation factor. Now, if I have to define R squared, our coefficient of determination, we square this number, and notice when you square a negative, you get a positive. And it actually has contextual um, information in our problem here. So we can take that number and say, to, say in our study that 98.9% .9 of the variation in Y can be explained by the least squared regression line. Now this is a script I'd wanna copy on my test. Um, you also notice sometimes they'll say can be explained by the temperature outside, right? This, both, either of these would be correct. Okay. Now, what else could they ask? Um, it's common for them to ask interpreting the y-intercept. So in this same instance, the y-intercept is when x is zero. So if you look back at your equation, just like in algebra, and you substitute in a zero, Notice you get your y-intercept right there. So the y-intercept is that first number that in stats we call A. So if we think about that, that means that the bill is $200.74 when it's zero outside. Well, zero is really, really cold. So that's why your bill is so high because it's cold outside. Um, one last thing I wanted to note about intercepts is they don't always provide meaningful statistics. So here, if all of these data points were collected between 50 and 100 degrees, then zero is outside of the domain of your numbers. And so oftentimes they'll ask, does the intercept, what is the intercept? What does it mean in the problem? And does it have meaningful, does it provide meaningful statistics? And sometimes it doesn't, which is okay if it's outside the domain, domain of the numbers. All right, what are some other definitions I'd like to go over? Well, um, if my numbers are going up, if my dots are going up, right, then what we're really saying is as X goes up, if I go right on a number line, then the Y values are going up on the Y axis. Negative would mean as the X values go up, the Y goes down. Linear, as we said before, means the points are following a straight line. Um, so the strength is usually defined as strong, weak, or somewhere in between, we wrote moderate. Strong means that the points are close to the line. Therefore, weak would mean the points are not very close to the line. Okay, so now this gets into the research idea of this. If you're doing two quantitative variables and you're just merely observing people, then if you see a correlation there, you can't say causation. Knowing one is just going to help me predict the other, but if I merely observed, I can't say causation. So many students wanna know, when can I say causation? Well, I can say causation if um, it was a randomized experiment that was properly designed, and then I can say causation if, if I have correlation. If I don't have correlation, of course, I can't say anything. I'm just, I got bad data here, but if it's properly designed, 
Um, and you see causation, or excuse me, and you see correlation, you can then say causation, but you can only make an inference, to, you know, depending on how you design that experiment, maybe only on the people you experimented on. Okay, so what are some, um, a couple of other tricky things that come up. One of the things is calculating, if they give you some, this feels like an algebra or an algebra two question. What if they give you a bunch of values? Can I plug these in? And that, that answer is just like an algebra one or geometry. You have these formulas on my little cheat sheet. This is beside me. And so if they give you a bunch of these values, you just plug them in, plug in the given information and solve. So if I was given R, I plug it in there. If I'm given X bar, I plug it in there. If I'm given the standard deviation of X, I plug it right there. If I'm given Y bar, the mean of the Y values, I plug it in there. If I'm given the standard deviation of Y, I plug it in there. Now, if I plug everything in, I find out that B1 is one and a half. And then when I go to B0 or B0, I plug in all that as well, and since I already found out what B1 was, I can plug that in to that location, and I get my value for B0. Okay, so now that I know B1 and B0, I can now go back to my least squared regression line, and voila, there it is. So when would I have to do that? This is if they're mean, and they don't just come out and give me this equation. So let's think for a minute, when would be another reason why they're being mean and they're not just giving me the least square regression line equation? That comes up when I have to read a computer output. So we're gonna ignore some of the stuff on the right and R squared adjacent. So usually the printout has a bunch of the stuff over here and I'm just copied down the stuff on the left-hand side. So let's take a look of the computer output and build our own least squared regression line. Now, typically it sets a predictor, constant, and then hours television. That's my X value. So I automatically know what my X value is because it's listed there. Now let's take a look. My constant is my Y intercept. So that's gonna go there. Um, whatever's next to my X, so just like in a regular equation, the slope is next to the X. Whatever number's next to the label of X, that's my slope. So this is, in the problem they said, we are using the number of hours of television to predict your power consumption at home. Notice we're predicting the power consumption using the hours of television, and so that's our X. Okay, so that's my information there. Um, what one little curveball do they sometimes give? Okay, so we did a couple of uh, activities like this in class. So I want to mention this. It came up um, on a couple of multiple choice. What happens when they're changing the slope or correlation by adding or removing a data point? So remember what a least squared regression line is. If I added that data point that has the little star on it, Notice that my line of best fit would be drugged down a little bit to get closer to the star. So by adding the star, it would cause the least squared regression line to pull closer to the star. And if it did that, it would ever so slightly go like this. It would tip it. So by tipping it, notice my hand is getting slightly steeper slope. It also, my elbow on my hand would move down, the, the y-intercept would decrease, but notice that the star is actually a little closer to the line than some of these other points. So that would actually increase the correlation. So that's what that means there, since the star is pretty close to the least square regression line compared to some of the other points. All right, guys, thanks for joining me for my review of Unit 2 and how to squish all your notes for Unit 2 on one page. Um, I hope you enjoyed and I look forward to seeing your guys's notes. Take care.